Abraham was a man that dated God and his wife didn't help matters much. In Genesis 15, Abram says, But God, I don't have an heir to my house. I understand how he feels. I have no son. I have no, nobody in which to impart what I've, I've gathered by the grace of God. His wife at one point hid in a tent and laughed when the angels came. And the angel said, your wife's, why did you laugh, sir? Why are you laughing? I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. And he had to live with that, mocking, until the wife finally finished. Oh, go and sleep with my handmaiden. She'll give you a son just as good. It's not just as good. And the angels came to tell him so. What were they saying to him? Hold fast, Abram. Doubt not the word of the Lord about this time in the season of women. Your wife, Sarah, will bring forth a son. And she was 80-something years old. <laughs> he bumped a 100. And it came to pass. And so I started thinking, the standing has a lot more to do with my trusting in God. Standing doesn't mean that I have to be about the business of warring a good warfare physically. The warfare is won here in my heart and in my mind before it's ever won on the battlefield. And what God is saying to this last day's remnant generation in the midst of the Laodicean, backslidden, half-hearted, people-driven church. And it is a people-driven church. It's a popularity-driven church. And I'm telling you, it will fail. Because it's not founded on the word A. You can't find in the scriptures that the last day's church is going to be a church full of shouting and singing and glorifying God. But... It's not there. The true, depart, the true departing from the faith called the apostasy is what I read. And it's not just in one place, it's all through the scripture. Jesus himself said, when you see these things beginning to happen. The apostle Paul, under the direction of the Holy Spirit, said, before the Lord can return, the apostasy must take place and the revealing of the one called the Antichrist. This is the ninth imam that the Muslims are looking for. He's their version of Jesus. But before all of this can happen, two or three things have to happen. And the scriptures all certify it and Jesus did as well. There's going to be a general worldwide backsliding from the faith. In the last days some shall depart from the faith. What faith? The faith that they began with. In Jesus Christ. He'll become a name, an icon, not a living savior in the hearts of men and women. How can you build me a temple? I could almost prophesy. How can you build me a temple when I dwell no longer in a temple built with man's hands, but I dwell within the hearts of men and women? How, it's easy enough to sin outside of a house if your salvation is in that house. If salvation was only in the four doors as it was in the old-fashioned temple of God, Solomon's temple, you could leave that temple and find every excuse in the world to be in sin. But inside those four walls surrounded by the rabbis and, the, and all the smoke and the incense and, a, see, and, the, and the burning of the sacrifice, very difficult. To even consider sin. But outside of that, away from the atmosphere of the worship of Jehovah, it was easy for people to commit sin behind closed doors. Because nobody was there to see it. But what do you do now, my brothers and sisters, where Jesus said, I no longer dwell in that temple, I dwell within you. Amen. Jesus said, the Spirit of God dwelleth in you, therefore you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, Paul said. Amen. How can you sin when you carry the temple in you? That's what Paul says, you know you, know, you can no longer sin. Oh, yes, we can. No, you cannot sin without the acknowledgement of the fact that you have or are considering it because the temple of God, the fire of God is burning inside your heart. If you're born again and you're part of the remnant, I challenge you, you cannot even contemplate sin without knowing that it's sin. And even if you do sin after that, the Holy Spirit will convict you of that sin. Not up for me to see it. No one's there to see my sin, but I know it. And I have an obligation then to get that right. 
by repenting of that sin and turning away. And it's a fool that says there's no need to do that. Out of Tulsa a few years back came the revelation that even Satan can be saved. I'm telling you, the world's in bad shape. And if you think money is going to be your defense, James, the half-brother of Jesus, weep and howl, you rich men, for you've, you've heaped up for the last days. Everywhere now you're going to start seeing large investment companies beleaguing people to set up a plans and investments and schemes to get finances for the last days. Gold and silver, they're pushing, pushing, pushing. It'll always be unstable. Gold, the, the, the last move around the world is going to be a universal currency, and we're very close to it. In which case, they will just declare one day, sovereignly, the US dollar as the sovereign currency, a federal currency, reserve currency, is no longer in existence. Now it's a digital currency. It may be even still controlled by the US for a while, but eventually it will be controlled by the World Bank. Then you'll be issued a number. And you won't be able to carry on a business anywhere without that number. It's called the mark of the beast. More particularly, it's called the identification of the beast system. And to take that number is to deny Christ. And after the Antichrist is established, and it will come more than likely, in my opinion, after the rapture, those people who've taken on that mark will perish. You can lose your salvation by taking it. It's simply a mark of, it's the same as Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, bowing down and worshipping the statue. Whenever you hear the sound, the whole of Babylon had to turn around and bow down and worship Nebuchadnezzar as the king. It's Antichrist, it's the type. One of these days we should teach it to you, it's, it's, it's amazing. He said, everybody in your kingdom, oh, Nebuchadnezzar, because he was already halfway to being converted. So all the wise men, all the other apostles and archbishops and grand bishops and poobahs that have named themselves to be so, I've challenged two already over the internet. How can you call yourself a bishop? You're barely saved. You know, they still called me back and asked me if they could come in here and preach. I don't know. To me, you're barely saved. I'm not having anybody in. I'm waiting for Jesus to come. One of them said, yes, yeah, something's got to change. Kind people, good people. But kind of, kind of broken. Why, why would I invite people to come here and teach you and they themselves are in the same ditch? I mean, then you've got to look at me going, I remember a few years back somebody got out here and started prophesying. It was dumb as a, dumb as a doorknob. And we had a whole lot more people in attendance. And without exception, the whole congregation looked at me like. <laughs> so, yeah, they were going to say that. What are you going to do about this guy? Right? But they're smart. That's the way it should be. You should be discerning. You should know who's talking to you in the supermarket if he's a weirdo. You know? Welcoming people into your home. And next thing they go berserk and shoot people. Now, we have to take, we have to take you know, care about these things. That's why, you know, I'm happy to have Brother Swanson and his team to watch over you. It'd be stupid not to do that. What do you want me, leaping off the platform and pulling out a 45 or something? Or... <laughs> Sound good to me, but I mean, I... <laughs> I go to a 40 caliber now, actually. I'm changing my thinking a little bit. Big is not better, right? <laughs> so anyhow, in this situation with the, with the last days, you need to educate people and they have to watch over. I guarantee most of these people today who say that they are sent from heaven to oversee you, they will be on the first train out of town. <laughs> Me? I'm not their pastor. No, no, no. Heard of him. No, no, no. But you're Peter. You, you, you. Yeah, you hanging around with Jesus. We say, Me? No. Don't even know the man. See? Up until that point, he was just a churchgoer. And at the end, he was crucified upside down. I cannot be crucified in the way that my master was. Even doubting Thomas, who went to India, he was supposedly been boiled, he was boiled in oil by the records say, the Indian records say, he was boiled in oil by those who were cult leaders and worshippers of idols. They boiled him in oil, but he wouldn't die. The oil didn't kill him. They took him out and beat his head in. They crushed his skull.
There's people all over the world, and I met them in the Philippines who are dead now because they served Christ in their little churches up in the Philippine Highlands. Buried in anthills with their ears cut off, and then they poured treacle or, or honey over their heads, and the ants literally ate their brains out. But here in the United States, of course, you know, you don't have a good enough praise team, we'll find somewhere else to go. Really? Really? Yeah. So we discovered that the standing process is what's going to be the greatest sign of those who are born again by the Spirit of God, not standing idly by. That we spoke about by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. How to pray to get results. Then we moved on to the next part, that in everything, give thanks for this is the will of God, will of God in Christ concerning you. Give thanks for everything. What's the everything? The evil day. You don't give thanks for something that's going bad. No, give thanks for the fact that your, your faith and your recognition is in the knowledge of Christ and that God will deliver me out of this snare of the fowler. That the, red, that the Dead Sea, the Red Sea, or any other kind of obstruction, the Sea of Galilee, none of these things can stop me from reaching the other side. Amen. That if God said I'll do it, He will bring it to pass. Yes. That He's not a man that He should lie. Yes. Or the child of a man that He should repent when He sees war or problems. But God's hand what must be and will be upon the remnant in these last days. The Bible says that even the Antichrist and all of those who serve Him will not be able to put down even one who is stamped with God's seal of approval. The order of events is amazing. After the catching up of the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, then it says that 144,000, which a lot of people used to say is literal 144,000 uh, Jewish evangelists, virgins. I don't know how they got all this stuff. Brother Hilton, I traveled with him for years. He believed that. I don't. The 144,000 is a type of the, the fulfillment of the 12 by the 12, which is 144 and 1,000 uh, uh, multiplied numbers of Jewish evangelists who are anointed by God to win the nation of Israel back to Christ. And it says that in the last days, once the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, these evangelists are released. This is after the catching up of the church. See, it says, He that withholdeth, once the, once the church has been caught up, then the Jewish evangelists be released in Israel. And the difference between the Gentiles and the Jewish nation is that Gentiles, you and I, are saved one by one. Each one is added to the kingdom as an individual. But Israel will not be so after the catching up of the saints. These evangelists will be preaching, broadcasting the gospel of the kingdom to the whole nation of Israel. And it says that Israel as a nation will all be saved. See, God still considers Israel his people. They are my sons and my daughters. He, he, he loves Israel. See, those who bless Jerusalem are blessed by God. That's why it's important for us to maintain ties, prayer ties, support ties, protective ties to Israel. Now, my brothers and sisters, as the kingdom of God has added the Gentiles, who went to the Gentiles, who was offered first to the Jew, they rejected him, went to the Gentiles one by one. Everybody gets saved as an individual. Not so with Israel. Israel will come to know Jesus en masse. Millions. And the reason that God is bringing all them back from the various countries of the world, which was prophesied also in Ezekiel, that they'll bring them from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Jews are coming in from Europe and from Russia, from all over the world, moving back to Israel. When Israel gets saved, that whole nation, boom, just like that. Every single one with their hands lifted up, worshipping Jesus Christ. After the rapture. After the fullness of the Gentiles. The same way people misunderstand the catching up of the church. One should be taken, one should be left. He's not talking about necessarily judgments there, but the, the circle of the globe. One side of the world, it's, it's daytime. The other side, it's nighttime. One will be working in the field. One will be in bed. You see, it's, it's not so difficult when you start to look at it from the prophet's perspective. All right, so I want to move on real finally to the last key. 
We talked about standing, how to stand, getting your prayer life established in these last days. So the standing is like some of your martial arts standing. You know, the stance that people make. You know, I, I forget how to do a lot of it now and I want to because I messed up my knees. But being able to move fluidly and still maintain a good solid stance. Go to one of Wes's classes, he teach you all that stuff. If you really want to know it. God's saying it's the same thing. When you make a stand in these last days, I'll stand with you. But you've got to be standing. You've you got to be there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's like, where are my children? We're making a stand. Where from? The, your lazy boy recliner? No, we make a stand together. See? He told Jehoshaphat, you know, submit yourself unto God, you know, and, and, and listen to his prophets, obey your prophets, and so you shall prosper. But he told his people when he prayed that wonderful prayer in 2 Chronicles, when, when the Spirit of the Lord comes, he'll tell you, this is where the battle is, this is what their plans are. See? When you get to such and such a place, make your stand there. Make your stand there. And I'll defeat your enemy on their way to you. They were even killing each other. <laughs> yeah, amazing. I started thinking about the trusting in God. Abram in Genesis 15, 2 Kings, talking about the time of the abundance of rain, the latter-day rain of God. I'm almost finished. The latter-day rain of God. The former and the latter rain, which in Israel is really important for the crops, especially their wine crops, vineyards. The former rain got the seed, the ground moistened for the seed to germinate. The latter rains became very light rains in which brought the crop to fruition to ripening it's a type also of the last days the outpouring of the spirit of God in these last days which we're in right now the Laodicean church is being rained on it shows you about the graciousness of God man not willing that any should perish a bunch of rebellious children who keep saying no 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 and the Lord's still banging on the door banging on the door when he stops banging on the door look out that's when he's coming back and then it'll be too late parable of the virgins you know Oh, I got my oil. Too late. On their way getting it, the doors were shut. That's why I preach the way I do. Not to be mad at people. I'm not mad at anybody. I just want you to realize we are it. We are that last generation. All right, grab this now. This is, a, this is the last, one of the last things that I want to talk about. And I'll just give you a little tidbit. It'll be in these last days, the third, so the first is the preparation, the knowledge of where we are. The second is understanding how to make a stand. The third thing is making a prayerful stand. And then the finally, the, the, the last key that pulls it all together is found in uh, Hebrews 10, verses 35, 36. If you put that on the screen for me, please, uh, Destiny. Hebrews 35, 36, 10, 35, and 36. One potato, two potato, three potato, four. Five potato, six potato. Hebrew is waiting for. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward. Now that word confidence is from a, a, a Greek word, which doesn't mean faith. It's not pisteo. It's a word which means being willing to declare why you believe verbally. In other words, to testify. In other words, don't keep your mouth shut in the last days concerning your faith. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence. Don't abandon your willingness to declare why you believe and why you have hope in you. Yes. It means a public declaration of what you believe. Then it says, which has great reward. In other words, your testimony, your willingness to share your faith with other folks will stop this abandonment taking place. You keep silent when God puts them up. How many people have bumped into previous members just in the last few months and you've bumped into them in strange places? Can I see your hands? It's got to be more. That's not by accident. God's bringing backsliders across your path. Yeah. I've seen sisters crossing each other's paths, haven't we, Destiny? Even living with them sometimes, you've got to be willing to open your mouth and take the risk that they'll walk away from you. Next verse, please. For you have need of endurance. Greek word, patience. So that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Now understand that. In other words, what he's doing is giving you a definition of standing. That after you have, you have need of patience, 
or endurance, the ability to stand. It's like a boxer, endurance. He keeps standing, keeps getting knocked down, getting up, knocked down, getting up, knocked down, a long distance runner. He runs and runs and runs and runs and runs. He never stops. He just keeps running. You can't stop this guy. He just keeps running. He has endurance. He's trained. He has been trained to endure hardship. So he says, is that you have need of patience that after you have done what you have been asked to do, made your stance in God, then demonstrate the thing that locks it all together, which is patience. The ability to wait until God shows up. You have need of patience that after you have done what God asks of you, make the stand so that you can inherit the promise. Say amen. amen. All right. I'll give you another scripture that you can research yourself to go with it. And we will find that in Matthew chapter 24. I'll make this one easy for you. Matthew 24, 13. Jesus said, He that endures to the end, that's the person that will be saved. You understand what I'm saying here now? Yeah. See, all the smart people are saying, ah, oh, yeah, it's too hypey, it's all too demanding, it's legalistic, I'm tired of waiting, I'm just going to hang around. If Jesus comes, he comes, if he doesn't, well, you're already lost. You've got to press in harder, even as you see the end approaching, because Jesus said the one who endure to the end, that's the one that will be saved. James 5, verses 7 through 12. Of course, we're here, we're talking about perseverance and patience. Very good. Now, King James Version, or New King James Version. Therefore, so what is the therefore, therefore? It's therefore to get this in our hearts and in our minds that in these last days, we're going to have to have patience. It says, therefore, be patient, my brethren, until the coming of the Lord. It's a last day scripture. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth? He waits patiently for it until it receives the, the early and the latter rain. There is a timing for the return of the Lord and a timing which is beyond your control. God is not asking you to understand it. Nor is he asking you for the prophetic revelation of when it might happen. He's saying to you, when the time comes, you'll be ready for it simply because of your willingness to endure and to be patient. He says the farmer has to be waiting until the crop comes in. Sometimes those rains are late. Sometimes you're going to have to really knuckle on down because the harvest may be a month or two months late. But the farmer knows that the life is in the seed and that surely, surely God will not ever allow his word not to prevail nor to produce. Whatever God sows, he reaps. So he goes on, he says, wait patiently for it. Let's back up a little bit. Verse 7 again, please. Wait patiently for it until it receives the early latter rain. You have an obligation to go through the beginning, through the middle, and right up to the end until the Spirit of God reigns upon the earth and Jesus Christ either returns for you or you go to be with him. Now we go to the next verse, verse 8. You also then be patient and establish your hearts. Establish, stabilize your hearts. Don't be flaky and listen to every other wind of doctrine. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is close by. He thought that 2,000 years ago. But now, of course, we have the added benefit of seeing all the fulfillment of the Scriptures. Haven't we? Verse 9 Look at this. Don't grumble about, against one another. Don't judge and criticize your brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. Don't come up with funky, weird arguments about what you believe. Who cares what you believe? If God hasn't said it, don't believe it. Amen. He says, don't do that. Don't judge one another and argue amongst yourselves concerning doctrine, especially in the last days, lest you be condemned. It doesn't please God that we murmur. That's why they didn't enter into the promised land. Do you remember? Behold, the judge is standing at the door. When Jesus comes back as the judge, he'll judge all of these things. 
So just keep your mouth shut, your heart open to God, and you'll be fine. Hold fast. My brethren, take the prophets. Somebody wants to. Who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. And you heard of the perseverance of Job, and you saw the end that was intended of the Lord. Now, Job didn't see it. We can read the book, go to the end, but Job didn't see it. All Job knew was that God is faithful. God answered him out of the world with, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Are you so smart? What stops the sea overwhelming the land? Where is this? What is that? Where is that? And Job, ah, bah, 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 bah. I don't know, Lord. Then, all right, then you keep shut your mouth and you keep quiet and trust in me because when I come, you'll know it. And so will all your fakey friends. He says, The Lord is very compassionate and full of mercy. But above all, my brethren, don't swear or make an oath or make promises either based on heaven or on earth or with any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, lest you fall in condemnation or into judgment. Can you say amen?